before I get into the message itself, let me make a couple of comments to kind of uh, set up this series and to offer some context to this letter. I think there's three things this morning that are important for us to know about Paul's letter. The first thing we need to know is who he's writing to. And he is writing, obviously, to Titus. I spent most of my week figuring that out, just to you. He's writing to Titus, but let me, let me say this. Um, Titus is someone who is a, a convert to Christianity. He's someone who, who came to Christianity from a background of unbelief. He was a, a Gentile. And he actually came to faith, it appears, under the ministry of Paul. But he didn't just come to faith. He actually, he actually ended up feeling a call himself to ministry. And so he joined Paul in ministry. We know because Titus is mentioned in, in several of Paul's letters, we know that he wasn't just accompanying Paul along the missionary journeys. We know that he was actually involved. He was active in that ministry work. And so you could say that they were colleagues. They, they worked together for a number of years. Uh, they were people who saw each other as friends. And Paul, he calls Titus his true son in our common faith. The second thing that you, that you need to know is where Paul is writing to. And Paul is writing to, to Titus while he's on the island of, of Crete. It's a small island in the Mediterranean. And it was an island that actually at that time, it kind of had, had a, a reputation because it was known kind of as, as a stronghold. It was known as a place that had a lot of mercenary soldiers. In fact, specifically, they had mercenary archers. It was an island where there were, there were a lot of people who were kind of hired guns. They were, they were hired to kill to whoever paid the most. And so as you can imagine, it was an island whose citizens, they didn't exactly have a reputation for uh, moral integrity. And that leads us to the reason then why Paul is writing the letter. That's the third thing. Paul is, is writing this letter to Titus because he wants to offer him encouragement as he attempts to establish a gospel presence on the island of Crete. And he wants to offer him advice about how he can establish and found a healthy church. And as you can imagine, I mean, Titus needs this encouragement. Right? He's working in this, this, this hostile, this secular culture. He was in a place where it was tough to do mission work. He was in a place where it was hard to share the gospel, a place where it was hard to establish a church. And so I want to say, even just from the context, there's a lesson that we can learn already before we get into the message itself, and that lesson is this. The gospel has to go to the hard places too. Right? God is clear that God wants the good news of Jesus Christ to go to the hard places too. And so we need to be ready to ask ourselves as we get into this letter and as we get into this series, are we as a church and are we as individuals, are we really willing to bring the gospel to the hard places? Are we willing to make ourselves uncomfortable? Are we willing to sacrifice things to have the gospel reach people who are unexpected, to go into environments that are difficult? Let's have that on our hearts and minds as we get into Paul's letter to Titus. There was a man named Brennan Manning. He was a man who, who actually uh, became a Franciscan priest. He was kind of an interesting, uh, an eccentric sort of character. He was someone who ended up, uh, he, he submitted himself to a lot of personal hardship, to a lot of personal suffering. And he did this intentionally because he had a, a particular conviction. And I wanted to share with you a quote from Brennan Manning this morning because, because it really speaks to his conviction. He said this. He said, The greatest single cause of atheism, unbelief, in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and who walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. Now, I don't exactly agree with every single aspect of this particular quote, but I would say if you were to tweak this quote, to change it just a little bit, I think you could say with fairness that the one thing that hurts evangelism and outreach and mission the most are Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and yet who go out and deny him by their lifestyle. 
Christians who claim to have a knowledge of the truth, but Christians who don't show that that's a truth that leads to godliness. And as Paul is, is writing this letter to Titus and to the Christian community on Crete, his concern the thing that worries him is he does not want to be this community. He does not want to be these people, to, to be believers like that. What Paul wants is for these Christians to be people of faith, knowledge, and godliness. I almost forgot one there. Faith, knowledge, and godliness. But all three of those things for Paul They center around the knowledge of the truth. There has to be a core truth, and that truth is the transformative, life-changing truth that you find described in the Word of God. The truth that Paul is talking about is the promise of life eternal, the promise of forgiveness of sins, the promise that you find fulfilled in Jesus Christ. I often think of John 14, verse 6 where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. I mean, that is, a, that is a truth that Paul himself has personally come to know. It's a truth that Paul himself has personally come to experience, and it has shaped his life. He's devoted his entire life to sharing that truth. He suffered for that truth. He's been imprisoned for that truth. He's given up everything. Everything because he wants to lead people with that truth. And that brings me to the first thing that I want us to take away from this passage today. And that is that if we want to lead people with the truth, then we need to be convicted ourselves personally that there is an objective truth, that there is an unshakable, rock-solid truth, and that is the truth that we find ultimately in Jesus Christ. We need to be convicted ourselves. We need to believe that. We need to be willing to devote our lives to pursuing that. We need to be willing to sacrifice for that, to give things up for that. And why does that matter for us today? Because your conviction, your faith, your belief in what is true, it shapes the way that you live. People will look at the way that you live and they will determine from that how convicted you are about your truth. Now we live in a world We live in a world that's kind of hostile to the idea of an absolute truth. We live in a world that that prefers to talk about about relative truth or about subjective truth. And that conviction, to at least least be fair, that conviction, it shapes the way that they live. I mean, because if you actually believe that truth is relative and that it's subjective and that you don't ultimately answer to anyone well, then you can live in a way which says, well, what's right is right for you and what's right is right for me. We're not going to have any fallout from this. Truth is relative. But as Christians, as Christians, you can't live that way because the one thing that you're claiming, the one thing that you hold to is that there is an objective truth. The one thing that you're claiming is that you believe that this that this is the inspired word of God, that what you have here is God-breathed, and that it is true because God is true, and because Paul says God does not lie. If we as Christians, if we as Christians are, are convicted that this is the truth, that this leads us to the truth of Jesus Christ, then it has to shape how we live. 
It has to shape how we live. If we believe that this is truth and we come across passages where, where, where they say don't have any sexual immorality or any uh, sexual impurity or don't be people of greed or don't be people of drunkenness, that's not a relative truth. That's not subjective. That doesn't apply in certain corners of your life and not apply in other corners of your life. It's objectively true. It is the way that God wants you to live. If God says, don't let there be any obscenity, don't let there be any swearing or cursing or, or crude joking, that's objectively true. It's not relative or subjective depending on where you work or what sport you're playing. It's objectively true. And it needs to shape the way that we live. The Word of God, I want you to understand this today, the Word of God, it is like a compass, it is like a GPS that guides us in truth. And it guides us ultimately to the truth that we find in Jesus Christ. And that truth is objectively true. Now granted, there are times in our lives where it might seem difficult to believe that. Especially when life throws us curveballs, then it becomes a lot harder to believe in an objective truth. A couple of summers ago, my wife and I and our kids, we were living for the summer near uh, Chicago, near Indiana there, Illinois, one of those states. <clears throat> this is not encouraging when you laugh at me. <laughs> we, we, we had good friends. We, we, we had good friends. Uh, I have to say they're good friends because they're here today. Um, we had good friends who were going to come down to visit us. They decided to make the trip to drive eight hours. Uh, they hadn't been there before like us, so they drove, they crossed the U.S. border, and they, they turned on their GPS because if you're directionally challenged at all, you know that the GPS is truth. Right? The GPS is truth. We even name ours. We call her Susie. Right? And what Susie speaks is truth. Susie takes you always where you need to go. So they had uh, Susie, maybe Sally, whatever they want to call it. So they, they, they drove across the U.S. border. They turned on Susie or Sally. But what they didn't realize was that the people that had used that GPS before them had changed the settings just a little bit and said, avoid major highways. <laughs> yeah, that's a good story. So, <laughs> so they came across the border and almost at the first exit, Susie was saying, you need to get off the highway. So they get off the highway because what do you do? I mean, Susie tells the truth. That's just what she does. So they got off the highway and they kept following Susie. Well, a couple hours later, they were in, I believe, some questionable district of Detroit. I think at this point, they were starting to question the truth. They were starting to question whether Susie really knew the truth. But here's a lesson for us. Truth is truth. Susie was still taking them on the way to their destination. She just wasn't taking them the way that they expected to go. And I think there's a lesson in life here. God's truth is still objectively true. And if you're willing to follow that truth and be committed to the truth of Jesus Christ, it will take you ultimately to your destination. It will not always take you the way that you want to go. And our calling as Christians and our calling as a church is to share with people that objective truth. But here's something to take away then. Here's something to remember. If we ourselves, in our lives, want to call people to follow that compass, to follow that GPS, to follow that truth, then we need to demonstrate by our lives that we ourselves actually believe in the compass, that we believe and have confidence in the GPS, that we trust the truth. Before we can lead other people with the truth, we need to be able to demonstrate that we ourselves follow that truth. This is obviously important for all of us as individuals, but it is especially important 
for leadership. And that's what Paul goes on to explain in the second half of this passage. Paul starts speaking to leaders. He says to Titus, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Now, Paul, he's left Titus in this difficult situation. He's left Titus with this difficult work. And he's writing to Titus to say, hey, we began the work together. Right? We started this together. We put some of the things in place But he says, now I need you to finish the work. I need you to put things together. And the thing that matters most to Paul, the first practical thing that he wants to get after is that you need to appoint elders. You need to appoint strong leaders. And that's going to bring us into the second thing that I want us to take away today. And that is that if we want to lead others with the truth, especially as a church, If we want to lead people with the truth, then we need leaders who demonstrate that they are willing to follow the truth. We need leaders who are willing to demonstrate that they are willing to follow the truth. Titus, says Paul, Titus, you are on the front lines of mission. You are in this secular society. You're fighting the battle. Here's how you establish a healthy church. You find for yourself faithful elders, faithful leaders. Now, it's been almost 2,000 years since this letter was written. I want to say this morning that this is a Christian principle that applies as much to the church today as it did to Titus on the island of Crete. If we truly want to be an instrument of God as a church, and if we want to grow and to establish and to multiply churches that are faithful to the truth, then we need to have leaders who are willing to follow the truth. Now, Paul here, he goes on to explain, and also from the context that this leadership, that this leadership role is a role that he's speaking of specifically in regard to men. And as a church, that is a position that we as well still hold today, and it's a ch- position that we hold because we believe that this is, is what the truth of God's word teaches. But if you're someone who's new here this morning, maybe somebody who's visiting or new to this, perhaps you look at this and say, well, that seems kind of like an absurd, like an offensive position. Because our society would suggest to us that we should abandon this position because it's, it's sexist or it's chauvinist or because it's just creating a culture of, a, of an old boys club. So, so I want to make just a, a couple of quick comments about this. I don't have time to give a full explanation or, or to go through all of the relevant texts. But I do want to say to you that this is not an issue of equality. We as a church, we don't believe that men are more valuable than women that they are more important than women. We don't believe that somehow they, they, they carry more weight or that they bring more to the table than women. We don't believe that it's an issue of capability. I think all of us, if we're honest, are certainly it's not an issue of capability. There are a lot of women that are smarter than us. But it's not an issue of capability. We don't think that men are are more theologically astute, that they're given to be more doctrinally intelligent. But what we do believe is that this is an issue of responsibility. Responsibility. We believe that one of the clear teachings of Scripture is that God holds men specifically accountable 
for the spiritual leadership. And that is especially relevant for the church. If you want to be people who lead with the truth, then you need to have people who are willing to demonstrate that they follow the truth. And Paul, he says, I want to see that in your lives in two areas. Paul says leaders need to demonstrate that in two areas of their life. One is this. They need to demonstrate it in the area of marriage and family. They need to demonstrate it in the area of their character and their conduct. Let me read verse 6 with you, which speaks about the marriage and the family. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Three things that we should see in our homes. The first is blameless. Now, I don't know if I'm speaking for all of the men here today, but I find that a bit of a discouraging statement. Blameless. None of us is blameless. It's perhaps not the best English translation. The idea that that Paul is going after here is that you are above reproach, that you are someone who is seen as honest, as trustworthy, that you are just, that in the way that you live, you are someone who is above questionable conduct. Second thing he says, you need to be faithful to your wife. Paul says to men, and I want to apply this to all men, leaders in the church, husbands, fathers, boyfriends, let me say this, You are called to be leaders in your marital faithfulness and in your sexual purity. Undoubtedly, according to the word of God, you are called to be leaders in your marital faithfulness and in your sexual purity. Final thing, you are not to be a man whose children believe, or sorry, whose children, you are to be a man. It's getting hot in here. You are to be a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. I find that this text is often prone to misinterpretation. So let me just quickly say this. Paul has in mind here children who are still under the family home and children who are are publicly and wildly and notoriously disobedient. Paul, he wants men to be leaders in their house because it has relevance for God's house. They are to be an overseer, a manager, he says, of God's house. And so if people look at you and they see you, they should see you leading your home with a character and an integrity and a faith that your children should want to imitate and to follow. And there's just a hard warning here too that if you are not ready to be a spiritual leader in your house, then you are not ready to be a spiritual leader in God's house. You have to be a leader in your marriage and in your family. Final thing is that you need to be a leader in your conduct and in your character. Paul carries on, he says, since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. It's not my intention this afternoon or this morning to get into each and every single one of these things. John Stott explains, and I think he explains it well, that Paul here is not dealing with the issue of specific sin. But Paul is using specific sins to highlight areas where we might be prone to temptation. He says, you should not be overbearing, warning against the temptation to pride. You should not be quick-tempered, warning against our temptation to be angry. You should not be given to drunkenness warning against your dependence on on vice or other things outside of Christ. You should not be violent. You should not be somebody who loves power. And you should not be pursuing dishonest gain. You should not be pursuing the love of money. Instead, he simply says, you must be hospitable. 
You must love what is good. You must be self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. This is the type of character that God calls us to. But I want to say this. I know I'm dealing specifically here with leadership and as it pertains to the, the leaders of elders and men, but make no mistake, this is an application and this is a character and conduct that God wants to see from all of us. This is the type of character and conduct that God wants to see. People who are passionate to do what is good, to be hospitable, people who are holy, people who do the difficult exercise of self-discipline. And how do you get there? We'll put it simply, you follow the example of Christ. If you want to be a leader, if you want to have even this character and this conduct, then you're serving not as a dictator, but you're serving as a servant leader as a sacrificial leader, the way that Christ leads. If you want to be a leader, then you're not overbearing, you're not proud, but then you lead with humility, the way that Christ led. You don't lead with a quick temper, but you lead with patience, following the example of Christ. You're not pursuing drunkenness. You're finding everything that you need in Christ. And you're not pursuing dishonest gain. You're not pursuing the love of money. You're not pursuing any of these things. But you are leading people in love as you follow Christ. If you're someone here today that has had moments where you haven't been the leader that you should have been, or maybe you've had times in your life where you've not showed the character and the conduct that you should have shown, how do you deal with that? Well, you trust the GPS. You trust the Word of God. You trust Christ, recognizing that there are times that you get off track, times that you end up in the middle of nowhere and you have no idea how you got there. But if you trust the Word of God and if you trust Christ, it will always bring you where you need to be. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this morning, for speaking to us. Lord, we pray that your spirit might powerfully apply your word to our hearts and to our lives, teaching us, growing us, shaping us. Lord, we are here in this present life, but we desire another life. We are here in this place, but we desire to be in another place. And we are confronted time and time and again in the word of God that there is only one way. There's only one path to get from where we are here to where we want to be in the glory of the life to come and that is through your son, Jesus Christ. And so Lord, would you help us to trust? Would you help us to grow in a knowledge of the truth? Because we know that if we grow in a knowledge of the truth, your spirit will lead that to godliness. It's inevitable. It is who you are, and it's how you make the type of people that you want us to be. Help us to love truth, to be passionate for truth. Help us to be devoted to the truth, to be willing to sacrifice for the truth. Also, that more and more people might come to know, that people might come to know Christ, that they might find grace and peace and forgiveness and a purpose and a meaning in him. Lord, we entrust ourselves to you. Lead us by your spirit. Guide us in all things. Bring us to the cross. Help us to hold fast, to hold firmly to that trustworthy message. Amen.